periodicals, and websites. This is going to be like an internet experience because when we flit to and fro in the internet, we spend about five seconds per whatever is in front of us, and then we move on. Rarely do we take the time to look at everything from the top of the page to the bottom of the page. And so I rather doubt in these 112 slides that I have to share with you in 45 minutes that you'll be able to read everything that's on all of them, and that's okay. Those who are younger in the audience will say, no big deal. Those who aren't will say, why is there so much on here? And why isn't he slowing down and reading everything? And that becomes part of the issues that we deal with in our modern world. But first, some basics. Um, the church, which is Christ's body, is made up of Christians. I don't want us to forget who we are and what the church is all about. He is the head of the body, the church, Colossians 1.18. We are privileged to be Christians who make up that church as living or lively stones, 1 Peter 2 and verse 5. The spiritual house that's being referred to is the church, not the building that we commonly call church buildings, but the Lord's church that may happen to assemble in a certain place. Christians, as individuals, have standards of behavior. Uh, and Christians gather into congregations and they get to know one another. Congregations um, have responsibilities as do Christians, as individuals. We can have acceptable works and we can have unacceptable works. The Christian Standard Bible I found interesting here, not a forgetful hearer, but a doer who works. That's intended to be who we are. And so as individuals, we have standards of behavior and acceptable works. As congregations, we have the same thing. We have a standard of behavior and we have acceptable works. And so with that in mind, hopefully there's agreement on all of that and we can proceed into the topic of the evening. God's rules for individual Christians are not the same as God's rule for a congregation. And the differences between what is acceptable for individuals and what is acceptable for congregations is very much misunderstood today. There are individuals who think nothing of doing things as a congregation that are only reserved for individuals. And there's a lot of problems and a lot of issues about that. Now, there appears to be a natural desire, I'm going to take us back in history quite a ways, for our deeds and our words to be preserved. In the Word of God, there's many references to written records and systems of sharing written communication. The Acts of Israel were recorded in history in some books that we do not have access to. Joshua 10 describes the day the sun stood still and the moon stopped so Israel could complete a battle. And then the verse says in verse 13, is this not written in the book of Jasher? We do not have that book. It appears that First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles are inspired summaries of other records that were also in existence at the time of their writing. Some of them are mentioned. The Acts of Solomon, the Kings of Israel, Chronicles, the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah, the Chronicles of King David, the Acts of Samuel the Seer, the Acts of Nathan the Prophet, the Acts of Gad the Seer, and so on. These are all, it appears to be diaries, if you will, of the things that happened during this time. So the books of the Chronicles of the King uh, appear to be public archives and they included details of what had happened in various reigns. An example of that is in Esther 6 verse 1 when the king could not sleep and they brought him the book of the records of the Chronicles of his own reign of course but he could have requested any other reign that they had records for and they were read before the king. The prophets uh, appear to have done this work of recording the details of the kingdom where they were and we see that from Isaiah, Jeremiah and also Daniel. And so there are written records that go a long ways back and the reason I'm going through this is because sometimes we end up thinking the only written records that ever happened long ago were the books of the Bible. And that is not the case. Nations also had systems of written communication. 
Also in the book of Esther, there was a system how a decree from the king could get from one end of the kingdom to another. It had to be written, copied, translated into the different languages within the kingdom, packaged. The wax that sealed that package was sealed with the king's signet ring, and then it was couriered to every province where it was read to all in the language of their understanding. And those, those messages would have been taken from one end of the Persian Empire to another, as Esther 8 verse 10 says, riding on royal horses bred from swift steeds. So this wasn't a, just an old plow horse that was used to get these messages. This was of the greatest urgency. By the time of the Roman Empire, their well-established system of highways enabled them to have an amazing system of communication. Perhaps we did not remember that Rome had a network of roads that extended from northern England all the way to southern Egypt. Some 53,000 miles of highways that they could transport messages on and troops. And this also helped greatly the spread of the gospel in the first century. It should not surprise us that the Roman Empire had at least the beginnings of what would appear to be a daily newspaper. And so that daily newspaper, the information was spread to different parts of the empire and it would have the things that we might expect to see in local newspapers through the ages, weddings, births, deaths, crimes, etc. Uh, as well as of course the astrological readings and the latest gladiator events. We're all looking for those in our latest news source, I'm sure. Well, by the time of the church, at least in the Roman Empire, written correspondence was actually quite common. And there were a lot of individuals who had authored letters that were copied, widely distributed, and well known. We see evidence of written communication, personal communication, in the Word of God. The Apostle Paul was informed by the household of Chloe that there were issues in the congregation. Whether or not that message was delivered in person from representatives of the household of Chloe, we don't know. But we do know, Paul says, you wrote to me about these things. So there was some written correspondence that was delivered and it would have been considered personal correspondence. However, there was more written than we have today. And some of that can be referred to in Colossians 4, where there we find that our brethren at Colossae were told, and see that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. Well, we don't have the epistle from Laodicea. Uh, we do not have that. And Linsky comments regarding that, this letter has not come down to us. And Kaufman explains one of the important revelations from this is that Paul's letters, and presumably those of other sacred writers, were widely circulated and passed among the churches, nor can there be any confidence that any more than a fraction of Paul's letters were preserved. It was God's providence alone that preserved for us the writings which make up the sacred canon of the New Testament. Another reference to a book we don't have is when Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 9, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. That means there was an epistle of Paul to Corinth before 1 Corinthians and we do not have that writing. In addition to inspired men, <clears throat> there were others who wrote many things during the first century of the church who may or may not have been inspired. And then there were many others who wrote in the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th centuries, as we've heard tonight, who certainly were not inspired to do so by the Holy Spirit. One of those references that helps us with this understanding is Luke's introduction to his gospel. He says, "...inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative." And so what Luke is saying, many others had written about Jesus. In his day, many had written about Christ. And so, I want to show you a listing of writings from the first several hundred years that have been preserved down to this present time in one form or another, some complete and some not. You're not going to be able to see these because intentionally, it's very small. So there are many other letters, the first 400 years, and this includes, of course, the books of the Bible, but many other writings as well. Okay, 
The list goes on. And the list goes on to take us up to about 380 A.D. Well, what was happening during this period of time? What was happening by the end of the first century was that there was great apostasy. And as we fast forward a thousand years, the apostasy, the separation from the truth, did not stop. In fact, it went further and further and further. And during this time, Catholicism was born with all of its tentacles. And there was still, though, a lot of writing. In spite of the great difficulties of doing that and preserving that, and by now the church is still present in the world, of course, but hidden. Now in 1424, there was a catalog of the Library of Cambridge that was written. That library consisted of 122 books in nine categories. And we may look at that and say, what? That's a college library? In 1424 it was, and it was considered one of the largest libraries in Europe. Now, a few years later, a man named Gutenberg starts working on a printing press. It took him four years to finish his wooden press, which used movable metal type, and it was made from a modified wine press. And that's a reproduction, of course, of what it might look like. And Gutenberg's works are not mentioned in any of his printed works. However, people have looked at the design of his type, his fonts, if you will, and they've been able to figure out what he printed in those years. His works included things that were in demand for duplication. You notice on one of those was the Catholic Letters of Indulgences. There was a great demand from the Catholic Church for letters of indulgences so they could sell the right to sin. And Gutenberg uh, was the one who printed many of those in the early days. This was in addition to his major achievement that we know of, his Bible, uh, that is commonly called the Gutenberg Bible to this day. Now this was in the mid-1400s. By 1499, Print houses with at least one printing press had become established in more than 2,500 cities in Europe. Upwards of 15 million books now exist in a world where travelers, scholars would travel miles to see a library with as few of 20 handwritten volumes. 30,000 new book titles have come into being and are being printed and widely distributed. Most in the 1400s were religious in nature, and I will add, hardly any of them would have been worth reading because of the apostasy that existed. Well, over the next 300 years, printing continues to spread around the world, included, including in North America, prior to and especially around the formation of the United States in 1776. So we come into being along here. And a little over a hundred years later, in the 1884 census report, there is a history that's recorded there of newspaper and periodical press that goes back in time quite a ways. And here's what they reported. In 1850, in the United States, there were 191 religious newspapers and periodicals. By 1880, that number had increased to 553 with probably around 5 million circulation. And so religious periodicals in the 1800s in the United States were very, very popular. Now, today we've got about 300 plus million people in the United States. I rather doubt that 10% of the population are still uh, subscribing to religious periodicals and newspapers of any kind. If we go back in history looking for the first USA religious periodical, Earl West reports that in 1808 Elias Smith issued the first issue of the Herald of Gospel Liberty and he had 274 subscribers. So we know at this time there was a subscription service to a publication of a religious nature. Now, that though, however, contrary to Earl West, 
is not the first because 65 years earlier there was a Christian history periodical published in Boston which was likely the first religious newspaper according to the history from the US Census Bureau report. Well in that time Alexander Campbell has come to America as has his father Thomas and in the fall of 1822 the debate that Campbell had with Walker had been published and so he identified the power of the press Campbell was a very successful farmer and a wealthy man. So when he start, wanted to start a newspaper, a religious periodical, he just bought the type, the presses, and built a building and started printing. And so he began publication of the Christian Baptist. The first issue of was August 3rd, 1823. Now, this is not one of those first issues but ever so many years those would be reprinted and then sold and I have an ancient copy of that but this is the this is what was in that very first issue it says Christianity is the perfection of that design, divine philanthropy which was gradually developing itself for 4,000 years. It is the bright effulgence of every divine attribute mingling and harmonizing as the different colors in the rainbow. Absolutely beautifully written. And if something could be said in five words or 50, Campbell always chose 50. And he did so uh, just eloquently and all the time. Other publications came to be. Barton W. Stone came along in 1826 with the Christian Messenger. And this is from the very first page of the very first issue of that particular publication. Uh, Campbell stopped the Christian Baptist and in 1830 began publishing the Millennial Harbinger. And this is the first page of the first issue, Monday, January 4th, 1830. And again, this is not the original issue, but it is a duplication of that from, uh, from the <coughs> mid-1800s was when this was was printed and published. However, this is a monthly a Millennial Harbinger from 1842. This has been what you would have gotten in the mail had you been a subscriber to the Millennial Harbinger in those days. Now, a little known fact about Campbell is that as the postmaster, he had what was called franking privileges. Franking privileges is what our legislators have today, meaning they get to mail things for free. Campbell mailed over a million copies of whatever he printed at absolutely no cost to him. So if you're going to be in the printing business as Alexander Campbell was, it certainly helps to be postmaster. Others came along. Walter Scott, the evangelist, 1832 through 35, and then again 37 through 42. And the Gospel Advocate uh, started... Uh, the Gospel Advocate started in 1855 and it is still continuing today. This is a, a bound copy of the monthly issues from 1872 that I have. You can see the string that somebody has, has bored through to, to hold that volume together. In the 1890s, if your subscription to the Gospel Advocate had expired, they had pieces of paper for your convenience where you could fill that out and send in your renewal. Large Quarterly came along in 1863 and lasted until 1867. A masterful writer, an amazing scholar, and one even though brief in publication is quoted as often as any of the restorers. Absolutely amazing. And if you ever have an opportunity to look at volume one, of large quarterly look there for an obituary that seems to never end and it is one of the most amazing pieces of writing that you will ever find and it's not all complimentary but anyway uh, this is uh, a Christian standard it was a weekly publication uh, in 1917 this is their annual book number and it is just absolutely a work of art uh, it is just absolutely beautiful in 1915, along comes the Apostolic Way. This particular, uh, this particular page, uh, you can see my grandfather's name at the top, Homer A. Gay. This was the issue of that paper that was mailed to him, uh, and it was from 1921. This introduces some names that we start to become familiar with. H.C. Harper, Dr. G.A. Trott, W.J. Rice, Clarence Truman, 
And these are individuals that I grew up hearing their names because they are part of our history. In 1932, along comes the Old Paths Advocate. Again, some familiar names, H.C. Harper, J.D. Phillips, Homer L. King, Homer L. Gay, H.E. Robertson. My mother still remembers going to Homer King's house as a young girl, uh, addressing the paper so that it could be mailed out. She still remembers doing that. She wonders, she may be the only one left at age 87 that remembers doing that. Some other publications along the way, 18, uh, 1956, The Proclaimer of Truth with L.G. Butler and Paul D. Mackey. Uh, Re Restoration Thoughts, uh, J. Irvin Waters in 1963. J. Irvin Waters again uh, in Outreach in 1967. And I didn't put the end dates. These didn't last very many years. Uh, they're not still ongoing. Then there's the Fellowship Forum, 1980. Again, this is Temple, Texas, so that's Irvin Waters as well. There's the Watchman. Uh, in 1982 that eventually merged with the Christian Expositor, 1987, in the beginning, uh, owned and published by Delmer Lee and Lonnie Kent York. The Christian Informer started by Richard Nichols in the 90s, I think it was in the 90s, and today Brother Bill Ferguson is the editor of that. There's a Christian's Expositor Journal, Smith Bibbins, Mike Criswell, Carl Johnson, uh, Nate Bibbins, Brett Hickey, Matt Trent, Brad Shockley, all names that we're very familiar with. And then today's version of the old Paz Advocate with the more modern uh, names as those have passed on. Now let's talk about money. Uh, perhaps you noticed that periodicals have traditionally been distributed through paid subscriptions. And the one that was from 1808 had 274 subscribers. So here's the question. Can I as an individual accept donations or dollars for subscriptions for a periodical? Well, first of all, we have for many years, without question. That doesn't mean it can't be questioned, but the question is, is it okay for someone to buy something from us that we have for sale? Can we sell our labor? Can we sell the results of our labor? Can we even make a profit? Was it okay for Paul to make and sell tents uh, along with Aquila and Priscilla? Hopefully no one believes their tents were made so they could lose money. After all, they were depending on it for their living. And they were selling them in the marketplace as they talked to people about the church. And so publications from the beginning, Alexander Campbell, just he just despised a paid clergy of any kind. So he taught that nobody should ever pay a preacher for anything. He liked to starve our brethren to death. And they were just dirt poor. Read some of the stories of like Raccoon John Smith and some of those and all that they went through. Nobody would give them anything to live on but expected them to do it all themselves. And Campbell, it was easy for him. He had married into a huge farm and had done very, very well. And so, but when Campbell wrote about the Christian Baptist in 1823, he said, the price of this paper is such as must convince all who reflect that it cannot be a lucrative scheme. Well, okay. He thought that would enhance publication as if the possibility of him making any money would mean brethren would reject it. Now, is that truly the way we have always been? Interesting. Millennial Harbinger, two fifty a year. Large Quarterly, two dollars a year. Christian Messenger, a dollar a year. Apostolic Way, fifty cents a year. Old Paz Advocate, nineteen thirty-two, a dollar a year. In those early years, uh, some offered advertising. This is from the uh, Apostolic Way in 1917, and on the right there is a railroad advertising. Uh, they're advertising the cheapest rates. There's also Dr. Trot, who was a doctor. Uh, advertising his good luck with treating cancer. And then down here for 10 cents, you can get pro and con, a 32-page tract on the Sunday school question. So there's all kinds of things there available in the apostolic way. Today's pricing, OPA, Christian's Expositor, Informer. And the Informator, Bill, Brother Bill Ferguson, says $8 suggested, but because subscriptions do not meet our costs, we are dependent on interested individuals to sustain the paper. Now, if we look back through time, we do know the Bible says of making of books there is no end. Google estimated the number of unique books, not periodicals, but books at at least 130 million. 
And that was immediately met with great criticism. The reason Google estimated it is because they're looking to copy all of them and have them available. However, that's not how many books have been printed. There's at least six billion Bibles alone that have been printed. And we have no idea how many periodicals have been printed. Now, periodicals. It's a familiar world for some of us. It refers to our brotherhood papers like the OPA, the Christian's Expositor, and those. Those who are older, 50 or plus, are usually familiar with our publications and our writers. Those who are younger, less than 30, are not. It is likely that they've never had their own subscription to one of our periodicals. It is likely they've not picked up an issue of one if they see it in the home where they live or where they visit it. If they have picked it up, it is also likely they've never read a single issue from cover to cover. Tell me different if, it's, if I'm off base. What has changed? Well, a lot of people don't read. And a lot of people who read don't, use, don't read books or periodicals. Uh, 2017 research, 33% of U.S. high school graduates never read a book after high school. 42% of college students never read another book after they graduate. Many have not bought a book in the last year, haven't been in a bookstore, I presume uh, brick and mortar or online, and many do not finish the books that they start. What has, what has changed? Well, for one thing, the internet has happened. The equivalent of the invention of the printing press has happened in our time, and it greatly magnifies the ability to communicate and to publish. This has revolutionized the printed word, the ease of sharing information, and the internet has also promoted having the attention span of a gnat. And by that I mean not long. You just flit from here to here. Okay, 1.3 billion websites as of January 2018. Google processes 6,586,000,000 search queries a day, 15% of which are new. Over 2 million blog posts are published on the internet every single day. Who uses the internet? Now this line on the bottom is for those that are a mere 65, like me, and older. You can see our use of the internet is not so much. And we kept saying it's not gonna last. It's not gonna last. Just like I'm sure some said that newfangled printing press, it's not gonna last. Now, for those who are 18 to 29 and younger, the statistics today is that 9 in 10 American adults use the internet. And so if you're of my age group and you're saying, ah, I don't have anything to do with the internet, you're behind. And you're going to get behind her and look up the grammar on that and uh, see, see what you think. Okay, <clears throat> world population, 7.6 billion, 3.5 billion internet users. Active social media users, over 3 billion. Facebook, 22% of the world's population uses Facebook. 79% U.S. adults actively use Facebook. 400 new users every minute. Twitter, uh, the average Twitter user has 707 followers, 1.3 billion accounts, 330 million are active. President Trump has over 40 million followers. And as much as he tweets, he cannot keep up with tweeting 6,000 tweets every second. And that's how many get sent. If you've never tweeted, you are behind. Just say, you are behind. And so, LinkedIn, 500 million members in 200 countries. Instagram, 800 million monthly active users, 500 million daily active users, around 95 million photos are uploaded each day. Google Plus, 375 million active accounts. Pinterest, 175 million monthly active users. Snapchat, 178 million active users daily. 47% of U.S. teens think it's better than Facebook. And if we're sitting here saying, what was Facebook again? <laughs> Snap what? Uh, understand we're behind. 
if that's where we're at, we are behind. In 2016, $90 million was spent on Snapchat ads. There is a monetization to the internet. YouTube, 1.5 billion monthly active YouTube users and there are 400 hours worth of video content uploaded every minute onto YouTube. 400 hours. Who can use social media? Anyone with the ability to connect to the internet, a device that will handle the downloading of whatever is necessary, and I do mean anyone. <laughs> so a few years back when I was in college, I was given an assignment and I needed to post that on YouTube. So I did. It's a persona speech. It has had 74 views. <laughs> and, and my page has two subscribers. <laughs> I just want you to know, for a 65-year-old, that is a major accomplishment. Now, I went on in another class, and I had a speech on Japanese Tengu masks. And I know that's a burning subject that you've just been itching to hear about, but this one is slightly more popular because it has 548 views, still the same two followers. <laughs> and now, I mentioned the monetization of the internet. Uh, in This year, YouTube changed their policy. You need 10,000 total views to join the program where you can advertise, but you also need 1,000 subscribers. I, I'm a little behind, okay? So I don't think I need to quit my day job. However, YouTube earnings in 2017, you might recognize some of these names, but the top earner on YouTube, $16.5 million in the year for the advertisements that were placed on their pages. Number of subscribers to these people. I recognize a few of these names. PewDiePie is not one that's just, maybe I'm not saying that right. He has 58.39 million followers. Now, Taylor Swift, I've heard of her. I, I do know, 26.59 million followers. So the sheer volume of all of this is amazing. And the monetization of this, if you get one ten thousandth of a cent every time somebody clicks on something that you have posted and you have this many followers, you end up with enormous sums. And so, of course, we're free to do whatever we want with this new means of communicating, right? Well, no. Media may change, but the Bible doesn't. Before the printing press, the same Bible rules existed as afterward. Before the internet, the same Bible rules existed as afterward. The Bible is still given by the inspiration of God. It is still what we need to be thoroughly equipped and complete for every good work. So what about websites and pages among us? There's a bunch of them out there. And... I won't begin to say I know all of them because I don't. Now, this is the Christian Repository, a fairly new site, and it attempts to be the place where all sites that are known among us are referred to. And so the sections of this particular, there's archives, Bible study questions, brotherhood resources, what's new, congregational websites, digital library, other resources, and then contact. And so you can see under the Brotherhood Resources page, it starts listing a bunch of the pages that will likely be familiar with many who are here. Under the congregational websites, again, it lists as many congregational websites as are faithful among us that are known. And so in the, in the world of personal pages and personal sites, there are millions of them, individuals, companies, schools, government, sites by all, for all, with every possible imaginable subject matter, including cat videos. So can I have a personal site or page and post things that I like from others or create myself? Yes, I did say cat videos. And this is a search on Google with the two words, cat videos, and in less than half a second, it returned 120 million results for cat videos. I had a college professor who proclaimed that cat videos were going to rule the world. And if you've never watched 
a friendly cat video, you are missing out. Some cat videos have been watched in excess of a hundred million times. And you may have been a hundred of those times on some of those. It doesn't know who, it just knows how many times. Now there is a music video. I'm guessing that that is uh, Despacito by Louis Fonzi featuring Daddy Yankee. And it is the most viewed video on YouTube with 4.9 billion views <coughs> as of this month. And if you've not watched that yet, that means their count may increase. And I have no idea. I doubt that it's worth watching as far as a Christian is concerned. But nevertheless, those are the types of numbers. Now, among us, there are some sites that are quite interesting because we think, Wow, my two, my 12 views and two followers, that's a lot. Well, not really. Uh, so, uh, Brother Austin McConnell, um, he posted a video. Uh, your parachute just failed. It's four minutes and eight seconds long. It has had 5,466,938 views as of the minute I did this screenshot with more every day. And it has had like 18,000 comments on this particular thing. His site, unlike mine, his site has uh, 396,000 subscribers. Remember I had two, two. 396,000. This is his personal site. He also has a site that features the lamplight.net that features religious things. And I want us to notice that on his personal site right up here there's a little red icon and then when we click on that we get a site called Patreon. Patreon. Patreon is how individuals can get paid for doing things for those who want to support them. He has 120 patrons who are giving him $444 a month. And we may look at that and say, okay, he had how many thousand followers? Uh, yeah, he had a bunch of followers, thousands upon thousands, and only 120 are paying him? No, 120 are paying him. And we may think $444 a month, that's not very much, but it's $444 a month that people are giving him voluntarily. Now, as we move into the modern internet world, can I, as an individual, accept money for my site or my page? Same principles apply. An individual is free to make tents and to profit from that endeavor if they choose to do so. An individual is free to take donations from an interested individual or to sell goods on eBay or Craigslist or sell information or even sell appropriate advertising. And so the question becomes, can someone be our patron? Is it okay for somebody to become our patron? Well, notice a verse here. Who was Theophilus in Luke 1 and 3 and Acts 1 and 1? There are several who comment that while he is unknown, he was very likely Luke's patron, a wealthy man who supported Luke in his work. Patronage then and now is the support, encouragement, privilege, or financial aid that an organization or an individual bestows upon another and it has an ancient history of individuals being supported by governments and wealthy individuals to be creative and do what they do. Now, is it okay for a congregation of the Lord's Church to give someone a gift for no reason? What about somebody saying, Greg, we saw your Tengu mass the speech. It was wonderful. We, we want to send you some money. <laughs> and uh, I did get an A on the assignment. But is that okay for a congregation to do? No, it's not. Because it does not meet the criteria for how a congregation is to spend the Lord's money. There are very specific rules for how a congregation is to spend the Lord's money. It is to be to specific qualified Christians that include needy saints, worthy widows, certain elders. Also to be for the preaching of the gospel. Also for the assembly of the saints for worship. And those things that are incidental to those requirements such as a building, songbooks, etc. So can a congregation choose to give me money or be my patron for my Tengu warrior masks? Not at all. 
Now, can an individual give me money? Well, of course, if they choose to, because there's different criteria for individuals versus the church. After all, Galatians 6.10 reminds us that it's fine for us as Christians to do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith, whereas the church is restricted in who the church can help. The church's money is for members of the Lord's church and for the preaching of the gospel. It's not for helping some college student with their Tengu warrior mask. Now, whose site is it anyway? Let's imagine two sites. One we'll just call Greg's Page. That would be me. And it's a mixture of religious writings and funny cat videos. Versus the other page that is the 64th Street Church of Christ where we work, live in Sacramento. Should those sites be different? Well, can different rules apply to the same media? Both use the internet. But let's look at it this way. If a congregation assembles for worship in a motel's meeting room from 9 to noon on Sunday, the rules of worship and the assembly of the church apply. We do not add the buffet breakfast after the fourth song and call it part of the worship. We don't do that. But if I as an individual rent that same room on Monday for a family gathering, I can serve the buffet breakfast if I want to. You see, there's a difference between what the church can do and what individuals can do. And so, whose site is it anyway? I'd say, let's believe what we see. If someone tells us a site belongs to a congregation, then we should establish our expectations based on that. If someone tells us the site does not belong to a congregation, then we can, we can establish our expectations based on that. So here's kind of a rule of thumb for comparison to me. Imagine we're visiting a real congregation in person. As we drive up to the congregation's meeting place, what do we expect to see? As we walk into the building, what do we expect to see and hear? As we look on the bulletin board in the entry, what do we expect to see? You see, when a website or a social media page is in the name of the congregation, we should expect to see and hear exactly what we would observe if we were to visit the congregation in person and not be surprised. We should expect to have the rule of the scriptures applied in every area of inspection, the role differences between men and women, uh, the submissiveness of children and members, a difference between the works of the church and works of individuals, and only those things that the scriptures authorize. And so here are some sites. Leewood Village, a brand new site. Notice, if you will, how careful they are. Home, articles, track rack. <laughs> so it's just like you're walking in the building and you'd feel right at home looking at this site or walking in their building and seeing these things. Sermons, Bible course, about us, contact, locate a church. <coughs> Garrett's Creek Church of Christ, West Virginia, where my brother-in-law, Wynn Baker, is. Again, very similar, what you expect to see. This fine congregation, again, no surprises, what you expect to see in a congregation's website. Now, the 64th Street congregation, the website has been out of date for years. And Brother Kevin Mackey really recently brought it up to date. And it is what you expect to see, to my knowledge, whenever we visit a congregation. What we should not see is women in leadership roles, musical instruments being played, uh, uh, donation appeals, fundraising activities, baby dedications, misuse of the treasury, cat videos. No, they have no place on a congregation's website. None at all. We should not see additions or subtractions from the scriptures. Those who seek after logos and expansive uh, pages on everything their logo means to them are just wasting words as far as a congregation's purpose is concerned. Mission statements have no place in God's people uh, because the Bible provides us with who we are and what we are to do. So what about our sites that are not congregation sites? We still have role assignments. And we still have rules that are right and wrong. And so when it is not a congregation site, but it is a personal site, then we need to behave as Christians, whether it's sharing recipes or sharing sermons, the same way we do when we're together in person. So if I want my sermons plus a speech about Japanese Tengu mask, I'm free to do that 
within the role that I have as a Christian individual. You see, we're never apart from congregational responsibility. Never, as individuals. And so, Acts 15 is about the responsibility of individual members to be submissive to congregational leadership involved in an issue of false doctrine. Not only did Paul and Barnabas stop the preaching of false doctrine, they then asked the preachers, where are you from? Who has sent you out? And they said, Jerusalem. So they went to Jerusalem and said, did you send these men out to preach this false doctrine? And so they were acting appropriately to discover who these, men, these members were responsible to. Even though we're always part of a congregation and subject to its leadership, our personal work is not the work of the church. When I go visit the sick, it is not 64th Street visiting the sick. It is me. And when someone says, well, the elders visit the sick, well, the elders have a fine work. But a lot of times the members let the elders do all the work. And so we each have individual works that we are to do. And the Bible's role rules have not changed. It is still sinful for a woman to preach the gospel in a public setting. And Facebook is a very public setting. And many times it's just pretty awkward when some of our dear sisters launch off on an explanation of Scripture and think that it's okay. False doctrine is still wrong no matter how it's presented. Gossip is easier than ever before and the wasting of time is easier than ever before. So what if someone doesn't like what an author says in the OPA or the Christian's Expositor? If they believe it to be wrong, they tell the author. And if they think it necessary, they may end up saying, where are you from? Same with a, a post on Facebook or YouTube. If somebody sees that and believes it to be wrong, what usually happens is nothing. And what is frightening to me is when hundreds of people will like something that is just contrary to the scriptures. That's just frightening to me. And some of the things that are posted in the name of wisdom from the church in different parts of the country and around the world are just horribly frightening to me. But sometimes it's just too big to tackle. But we need to be able at least to private messenger individuals who are saying things that we believe the scriptures teach are, are not correct and at least have a voice to say, I don't know that that's the best application of that scripture. And then, if we don't like the publication, don't renew the sub. If we don't like the website or the page, or the, that, that we just might quit going. However, understand we might be wrong. You know, in Matthew 18, just because you end up to the point where you get two or three to go with you to present a problem to the congregation doesn't mean they'll go. <laughs> because sometimes they say, brother, you don't have a case. And so we need to always check ourselves to make sure that we're right. Usually a congregation is very careful on their web pages, less so on Facebook, as if it's not somehow the same thing. And so each is equally public. Anything on Facebook will likely be seen far more than a congregation's website. And so as we have through the years been willing to subscribe to periodicals among us, I believe it is scriptural, the laborer being worthy of his hire, for individuals who produce works in any medium, whether print or online, to seek donations or even subscriptions for that work. The same way if you have a farm and your cow has a calf and you want to sell it, you don't expect somebody to come up and say, you're not going to charge me for that, are you? No. It's okay for you to get the market value for whatever that is. And if you don't like it, don't buy it. But please do not insist that the scriptures say we cannot be worthy of our labors of our hire.